So let's let's start with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to get together and study your word tonight. Bless us through it. Send your Holy Spirit that we may uh, grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and why that matters. Uh, as we study your word, strengthen us in our faith, strengthen us in our relationship with you and with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So we are on chapter three. Uh, we we just started chapter three last time. We had some good discussion on two. Um, were there any questions, Terry, from last time? Or anything that came up during the week? All right, then we'll roll into the roll into the new stuff. Um, <clears throat> chapter three, we're talking about our Savior, who is Jesus, who is the second person of the Trinity. Uh, why does it matter? Uh, last time we looked at all sorts of his names, and I had you guys brainstorm, and you came up with all sorts of names, Jesus, Christ, Messiah, Emmanuel, Redeemer, Savior, God, all of those, and we talked a little bit about those. Uh, the big one we highlighted was, was the Christ, or the Messiah, that anointed one, that one that was set apart for a specific job, the one that God had promised, and then Jesus came and said, I'm the one who was promised, and he proved it by fulfilling all of those promises. Um, so that Messiah, the promised one, was promised that he would be true God, and was also promised that he would be descendant to the woman. So uh, in our lesson today, we're going to talk about the two natures of Christ, so true God and true man. We're going to talk about the, the states of Christ existence, uh, his state of humiliation, and his state of exaltation. We'll explain what all, all that means, um, and then what that what that means for us. So uh, we start on the bottom of 13, and uh, uh, on that last bold section, our Savior is revealed to be true God. And in this section, I'm going to I'm going to skim a little bit as we go. Um, <clears throat> so there are many people today who would say, yeah, I believe Jesus existed. He was a great teacher. He was a great moral leader, but would stop short of saying he's true God. Um, C.S. Lewis one time wrote that, that he can't do that um, because based on what Jesus said and did, uh, he is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. There, there's no in between, right? Because he said he was the Messiah. Um, he said he was going to rise from the dead. If he's not true God, um, he's saying he's God. If you meet someone who is saying they're God, um, you got two choices. Either they're God or they're crazy, right? So if Jesus is claiming this stuff for himself, he's either a crazy man or he's true God. He's not a great teacher or a great moral leader if he's not true God. Um, he said a lot of things of what he was going to do, rise from the dead, that he was going to rule over all things. Um Either he's a liar or he actually is the Lord. Um, so when, when we look at um, what the Bible says about him, uh, it's it's not something that we can go halfway on. Either, either it's true or it's not. Um, it's not intellectually honest for us to sit here and say, well, I'll just be in the middle on this one. Um, I'll just say maybe he was just a really good teacher and a good dude, but not true God. That doesn't work. Um, not based on what he said and did. So, uh, is he really true God? Um, well, he's called God. Uh, kind of skim those passages. First John 5, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. And you look down to the bottom, he is the true God and eternal life. Colossians 2, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity, the, the God, uh, all the fullness of God lives in bodily form. John 1 in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and, and then he goes on and talks about how that Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, very clearly talking about Jesus, right? Um, so he's called God. First Corinthians 2, they crucified the Lord of glory. So the Bible is very clear in describing Jesus as true God. Um, but not just the names, he's also described with divine attributes. Uh, in lesson one, we looked at some of the attributes of God. Those same things 
are said about Jesus. You know, Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchangeable. Um, uh, he's omnipresent. Jesus said, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Omniscient or all-knowing. Uh, Peter says, Lord, you know all things. Uh, omnipotent, all-powerful. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth is going to give it to me. I've got all power. Um, so he's got those attributes. And then he did divine things. In, in John 1, where we, we just read at the beginning with the word, the word was God, uh, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So, so he was a part of creation, uh, something that only God does. Right? Hey, Bridget, come on in. Come on in. All right. Okay. Is coming in. Is coming in. So, uh, um, okay. What are these? So we're on page fourteen. New Who is Jesus? What, you know and what do we believe? He is true God. So his divine name. The Bible describes him as God. His divine attributes. And now we're going with his divine deeds. And so as we get into his divine deeds, read this uh, one. <laughs> miracles. Um, the brainstorm some of the miracles that you have heard Jesus doing. Um, so different people with different Bible backgrounds. Some of you may be familiar with, you know, eighty of them. Some of you may have said, "Yeah, I've heard of that one or that one." So, so name what you what can you think of? What uh, miracles that the Bible says Jesus did? Turning water into wine. Turning water into wine. That was that was his, his uh, the first of these miraculous signs he did. At the wedding of Cana. Excellent. Bring Lazarus back to life. Okay, bringing Lazarus back to life. And and the widow's son at Maine and Iris's daughter. He raised the dead. Yep. Restoring sight. Restoring sight. Blind Bartimaeus, the guy by the temple. The guy, you know, so several times gave sight to the blind. The about the woman with the issue of blood. Yeah, the issue of blood. So that was mm -hmm. in the middle of another miracle. <laughs> you know, he stopped and helps that woman. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that says healing the diseases like leprosy. Yes, the, the lepers, the ten lepers, the other leper. Um, yeah, healed, healed leprosy, healed paralysis. Mm -hmm. All right, the man lowered on the cot and mm -hmm. take up your mat and walk. And controlling the storm and walking on the water. Okay, those miracles of nature. He tells the storm to be quiet, and it is. He, he walks on the water through the storm to the disciples. Um, the fishes. Okay, the miraculous catch of fish. Hey, show your hands on the other side of the boat, and and you, these things that only God can do, right? Um, so if the Bible is true, and I believe it is, the Bible is really clear. Jesus is God. So if we say we believe the Bible, um, we can't say, yeah, but he was just a good dude. He was just a, a great moral teacher. Um, and then the last one, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, that's that story uh, we mentioned the uh, the healing of the paralytic. Um, this is one of those those classic Sunday school stories that uh, was one that always kind of just struck me. You know, the Jesus is teaching in a, in a house and the house is so full because everybody wants to see him. Some guys had a friend who was paralyzed. They try to bring him to Jesus for him to heal the guy. Um, can't get into the house, so they go up the outside steps. And they start peeling away the, the roof slats and, and they lower this guy on, on his mat with ropes down in front of Jesus. And, and Jesus looks at him and, and this is the thing that always shook me as a kid. Jesus looks at him and says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. They're like, come on, Jesus, you know what they're there for. He, he, they want him to be healed, right? Um, but Jesus knew what was even more important than the man physically walking, his relationship with God. He says, your sins are forgiven. And, and then it says that there were there were people there who were saying in their head, oh, who would this guy think he is? You know, only God can forgive sins. This guy's blaspheming. Um, and uh, and so Jesus says, I know what you're thinking. Um, but what is harder, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? This guy's been paralyzed um, for years and, uh, and there's no one had been able to help him. That's why they're, you know, bringing him to Jesus. Um, and so Jesus says, just so you know that the Son of Man, that's what he called himself, that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, get up, take your mat, walk, and the guy does. Um, so 
for the forgiveness of sins thing, I put this on there because we can't see forgiveness of sins, right? That's a, an interior thing, right? That's a, that's a spiritual thing. Um, but Jesus demonstrated that he absolutely had power to do that uh, because he had power to, uh, to uh, uh, let the man walk. So, divine name, divine attributes, divine deeds. The Bible is really clearly saying Jesus is a true God. The Bible just as clearly says something that seems like the opposite, that Jesus is true man. Right? Man and God aren't the same thing, right? That's the whole point of divinity. It's different than humanity. Um, but the Bible says both about Jesus. This is another one of those places we talk about the Trinity. One plus one plus one equals one. Our minds say, I don't get it. Here too, the Bible says he's true God, and then it says he's true man. Same, same reason. So gives him human names. Um, I've been talking too much, so I'll let you guys read some of these. Deborah, uh, first Timothy 2 5. <laughs> For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's called the man. Uh, Luke 24, he says, Look, I've got flesh and bones. A ghost doesn't have that. I'm I'm human. Matthew 26, he's got he's got human emotions, human experiences, right? My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Let's read Hebrews 4 15. Sabrina. Yeah. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. With our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Yeah, I remember last week we talked about the, the anointing, the, the Messiah, the, the pouring of oil, and how they would anoint their prophets, their priests, their kings. Um, the writer to the Hebrews here in, in this letter uh, is explaining how Jesus is the perfect priest and the perfect prophet and the perfect king. And so here's in the section where he's talking about the priest. He's like, you know, he's the perfect priest, and, and he's not one who doesn't get us, right? Because he's been through it all, just like us. Only difference, he didn't sin. Um, so truly human, the only difference, he didn't sin. Uh, Mark 11, he's hungry. John 4, he's tired. Um, so the Bible clearly describes Jesus with these human emotions, these human experiences, a human body. A human life. So you have the really tough question, and just in case it wasn't easy enough, I put the answer right there. What two things does scripture tell us about Jesus? Who wants to be for the day? <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So true God and true man, right? Um, so now the question is why? And here I'm going to ask you not to look at what's written down uh, until after we get a chance to talk about it. So um, why is that such a big deal? Because, um, like I said, there are people that deny either. Um, but if we believe what the Bible says, that doesn't work. So, why did Jesus have to be true man? How would you answer that one? Uh, more easily and relate to us. Okay. No one can see how to live, the Bible says, but God became man so that we could interact, so that we could, um, you know. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but he's been there, right? So we, we have that connection. Excellent. Yeah. Any other reasons? The sin entered so the world. Okay. So that he could redeem us. Yeah. So that he could redeem us. Okay. So he could redeem us. And, and, and Vicki, I think you were kind of on the same line. Uh, you want to finish your thought? Sin entered the world through a man, through Adam. And so the salvation comes through a man as well, who okay. is taking our place as, as human. Okay, so humans, we needed redeeming, we needed the saving. Uh, and so in order to become our substitute, right? Because uh, to get to heaven, what do you need? You need a perfect life and no sins, right? We had an imperfect life and sin. Uh, so in order to, to sub in for us, to be our substitute, we talk about the, the vicarious atonement. You want some big Bible words there? So <laughs> vicar, the, the sub, um, the, the substitute. So he's vicarious. So he's substituted to be our atonement, to, to pay that sacrifice that makes us that one with God, right? So um, so yeah, in order to, to substitute for us, he truly became one of us so that he he could um 
So yeah, you, you, now you can look. So number one, to be our substitute, right? Man for man, uh, to, to be able to live that perfect life, to, to be under the law so that he could obey the law, to, to put that on our record. Uh, and then the last one, I don't think we hit, to pay, right? To, to pay the price. What's the price? The wages of sin is death. God doesn't die. God became true man so that he could die. Um, Let's read Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Uh, is that Vicar turn to me? But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Okay, so you got that substitution in Hebrews 2, 14, dude. Mm -hmm. The children have flesh and blood. He too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is, the devil. Okay. We were human. He shared our humanity so he could, he could pay our price. So Jesus had to be true man. Thank God that he was. So now the flip side. Why did he have to be true God? The Bible says he is. Why is that so important? Mm -hmm. I feel like it would be important so that he could prove his worth to the, the humans, right? Okay. I mean, if he was saying he was true God, he just he showed nothing for it. No one would follow him. Okay. He's just a liar then, right? Just be crazy. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Other reason. How do we humans do at defeating sin? How do we, okay. how, how do we humans do at defeating the devil? Um, not so good. How do we humans do at defeating death? Um, yeah, that, that doesn't work. True God, he can do all those things. So true God, so that he could live the perfect life, so that so that he could, um, like you said, have the, the the backing to what he was saying, right? So that he could defeat the devil, so he could defeat death. Um, let's read First Corinthians 15, 55, 57. Shall we have that one? Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks to thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that passage. That's in in Paul's great resurrection chapter. He talks about how important the resurrection from the dead, Jesus rising from the dead, is. He says, if we don't have that, our faith is, is useless. What's the point? Um, but but this picture here, um, I remember. So when I was 19, my sister was 20, um, over Christmas break, she was driving to my brother's basketball game, and a drunk driver uh, came across and killed her pretty quickly, pretty instantly. Mm -hmm. um, and my oldest sister was married and in Dallas, and she and her husband drove, like, you know, instantly through the night and, and uh, um, got there. And when they got there, uh, my brother-in-law, he's pastor, he... He said, you know, the whole way I've been thinking about this passage, can I just share it with you? And this was the one he read. Um, and he talked about that that picture of you know a bee. When a bee stings someone, what happens to the bee? Dies. It dies. Right? So so the sting, the power of sin, the power of death, um, it put its sting in Jesus. And so that bee, death. It can't bother us anymore. You know, if you're at a picnic and there's a bee that's already released its stinger, it might buzz around for a couple more seconds before it falls. It can't hurt you. It might be annoying, but it can't really hurt you. Um, death, for a believer, has lost its sting because it put its sting into our Savior. He gives us the victory, right, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so on the bottom of the page, you've got that question. Uh, what would Jesus have accomplished for us if he was only a man or if he was only God? Well, if he was only man, he couldn't perform the miracles that he did. Okay. Yep. If he was only God, then he wouldn't have as much of a, a human connection with the rest of us. And okay. Maybe he understands yep. the sin a little bit more. Yeah. So, he would be able to make that sacrifice, would he? Right. Right. So, if, if, if he's only God, he can't die if he's only man he can't defeat that right i mean so so either way if if you know because like i said there are plenty 
who deny one or the other. Um, it just doesn't work. It reduces Jesus to uh, a good teacher or a great philosopher, which, like I started with, that doesn't work either. Because if he's a good teacher, he, he wouldn't be saying the things that he did if he wasn't really a true God. Um, so, awesome. Any questions on the two natures of Christ? True God and true man? I have one question. Okay. Um, when it says um, he died and, and he was ready uh, from the dead, mm -hmm. well, before he was he was um, he ascended, he descended, he went to hell. Mm -hmm. So now if he lived a perfect life, and he still went to hell. What chance do we have? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Can I put pause for a page and a half? Okay. Because if you see right there, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. And and what that whole thing is all about. But I like, you're thinking good thoughts because, um, yeah, that's exactly the kind of the next natural thing you got to think about, right? Um, so, yeah, so we talked about Jesus being true God and true man. Now we're going to talk about his two states of existence, his state of humiliation and his state of exaltation. So if you're listening to the sermon on Sunday, I mentioned his state of humiliation, right? Um, and I gave the confirmation definition for it, right? The, the state of humiliation was the time when Jesus set aside the full use of his divine power, right? Because God is eternal. God does not change. The Son of God is God, so is eternal and does not change. So at no time was Jesus not God. Right? He always was and is and will be God. I am who I am, right? All of um but for a time, for our sake, in order to understand our suffering, in order to deal with and, and truly pay the price, he set aside the full use of his divine power. And think about it, while he was living, when he did miracles, for whose benefit? Were they? All of the things that you mentioned, were any of them so he would be more comfortable? No. Um, I mean, in fact, he let himself be flogged and beaten and stripped and whipped and crucified. At any time during there, as true God, he could have said, that's it, um, and zapped everybody. But he didn't because he set aside the full use of his divine power um, for that time. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the state of humiliation. Not that um, you know, normally you think of humiliation like, uh, I don't know, you know, Danny Masterson gets, gets uh, 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 sent to jail for whatever, and, and that's humiliation, right? Um, Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He willingly suffered for us. So, so he humbled himself. Um, so, yeah, that state of humiliation, he sets aside the police of his divine powers. And you just kind of uh, walk through there and think about the different things that, that he went through. And, and maybe the Apostles' Creed is helpful in that. Um, in the shaded box there on the right side page, you have the creed. We say it every other Sunday. We say the Nicene Creed, the other ones. But um, that second article is a great way to kind of walk through. So the Apostles' Creed is three articles, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So the second article, talking about God the Son, is a great way to kind of walk through his state of humiliation. Um, so I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. True God became a couple of cells in the womb of a teenage, probably a teenage girl. Um, not very glamorous or glorious, right? There, there's a lot of powerful and and uh, um, impressive ways to enter a room. A birth canal is not one of them. But he willingly became that. You know, the God who, who holds the stars and the planets in their courses couldn't hold his own head up, right? He needed he needed someone to, to cradle his neck because he became that weak for us. He set aside the place of divine power. So, uh, uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. So you kind of fast forward in the creed, but think about think about his uh, his the time between them, his youth. You think the teacher's pet gets made fun of today? Imagine if you actually never did anything wrong. Um, 
you know, he willingly, the, the passage there, Luke 2.49 is where Jesus, as a 12-year-old, uh, they take him to the temple and he's talking with the, the rabbis and the teachers and, and studying God's word and, and his mom and dad leave thinking he's with them, but he's still there studying the word. They get a day away and realize, oh, he's not with our group. They come back. They're all frantic. What'd you do to us? And he's like, well, I was here studying the word. You know, didn't you know I need to be in my father's house? Uh, but then it, but then it says he he listened to them and, and, and went home with them and obeyed this couple that was not perfect. And he was, but he willingly humbled himself and what they should have been bowing down to him. But instead, he kept, you know, the fourth commandment in our place perfectly, honor your father. Um, so his youth, his his baptism, we talked about that last week or two weeks ago, where, where uh, John the Baptist was baptizing for repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus comes up and says, I want you to baptize me. And, and John says, what are you talking about? You don't need to be baptized. You're you're the son of God, and 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 Jesus says, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness. So he was doing what we needed. He was stepping in and and humbling himself to, to be the perfect human, right? Um, so his three-year ministry, you think about all the times that he was uh, persecuted and picked on and they wanted to kill him and, and didn't listen to him. At any time, he could have been, you know, that uh, but he did. He willingly did all of that to teach, to to love, to care for people. Uh, his suffering. Let, let's read that passage. Mark ten thirty three. Uh, Peach, is that your turn? You're going to go to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Yeah, as they were heading to Jerusalem. Three different times he pulls the disciples aside and says, just so you know, this is what's going to happen. He knew exactly the suffering that he was getting himself into. And it says he resolutely set out for Jerusalem, uh, willingly suffering for us. And then, of course, kind of the epitome of humiliation, he died. Uh, Betty, you want uh, Luke 23, 33? Okay. <laughs> Did you say I'll pass? Okay. Uh, and Zanetta, do you want to play or pass? I will, I will read okay. it. Okay. Um, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals on one of his right, one on his right, and the other on his left. Yeah. You, you couldn't think of a more humiliating death. Right. He didn't go out in some blaze of glory leading a, a charge against the enemy, but um, he willingly let them nail him to a tree. You know, the the there was a you know, passage in the old testament, cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. It was the the Romans' way of completely uh, well trying to make sure that anyone who saw it would never want to do what that guy did, right? Right. Uh, completely taking all and any dignity away. Um, and not just by himself, but right in the middle of criminals. Um, and then of course, John 19, Jesus says it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Um, so uh, he, they, while he was on the cross, the Bible records seven, seven different words or statements that Jesus made. And many of them directly are fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy. So in Psalm 22, I think it is, it talks about how the Messiah um, would, the, his tongue would stick to the roof of his mouth and he would say, I'm thirsty. And so the, the word right before this was, I am thirsty. And it says that they ran and got some wine vinegar and put it on a sponge and, and lifted it up to him. Uh, and so he he drank from that sponge uh, and then, uh, and then, he says, it is finished, and then he dies. Yep. And other passages then point back to him declaring it done as being more than just, um, I'm done drinking now. Uh, you know, okay, but the whole prophecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So Jesus died because the wages of sin is death, and we needed a payment made. We talked 
last time of, about that, how it shows God's justice and it shows God's love. Um, Jesus also lived a perfect life. I think we get the importance of his death, right? That paid our price. I think sometimes we overlook the importance of his perfect life. So I've got the question there. Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience to his heavenly father. For 33 years, he led a sinless life. How does the perfect life of Christ benefit us? Why is that such a big deal? That's fulfilling the law. I mean, we couldn't fulfill the law. Even if you think something wrong, it counts as a sin against you. No okay. man could do that. Okay. But he did. So, yeah. He took our place. Okay. <laughs> He's like, see, you can do it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so he, he uh, demonstrated perfectly, uh, you know, but yeah, even, you know, like you said, it'd be a slap in the face. If, if all it is, is he's doing it as an example and now we should be like him. Yeah, we want to be like him. But like Vicky said, we can't. You know, he talked about in, in, in Matthew 5 to 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about that, you know, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Uh, someone who, you know, a woman, who, a man who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Um, you know, even the thought uh, is sin. And, and yeah, we've, we've fallen short, but, but, he did it perfectly, um, you know, and that's where that. Uh, have I drawn? Have I drawn any pictures yet? No. All right. Okay. So I kind of talked through this before. Uh, what am I doing? Oh yeah, the dude. Okay. So to get to heaven, God says, "Be perfect," right? So you need plus perfection. Minus sin, and that that equals life, right? But here's me, um, and shocker. Anyone here for the children's sermon a, a couple months ago, where uh, one of the kids said the pastors are perfect, right? And I'm like, oh, oh boy, I appreciate that. Um, but I, I will tell you, yeah, there is not the perfection, right? But there is sin, and the Bible says the wage of sin is death, right? Um, but Here's where that perfect life of Christ comes in, because Jesus lived a perfect life. He deserved uh, life eternal because he, he never sinned, but he took that perfection and gave it to me. That's what that, that 33 years, and of course, the other side of it is all my sins got placed on him. So now you change, you know, now I've got his perfection and no sin and I get life. And he took my death. But since he had never sinned, that couldn't hold him. And so he rose, right? Um, so, you know, this is, that is art, right? <laughs> I should sign this. There you go. But yeah, you know, that, that 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He took our sin so that in him, we become the righteousness of God. Um, you know, that's, that's what it's all about, right? That's what allows us to stand before God. You know, we, we talked about on Sunday, we talked about Judgment Day. Um, should be a scary, scary thing, except for this, that now we get to stand before God and, and, Eagerly await those words come, you who are blessed by my Father, um, because Jesus took our sins and we stand perfect before Him. Um, any questions on the state of humiliation? So then, the other side of that is the state of exaltation. He reclaimed the fullness of His divine power, which He could have done at any time, but He waited until after it was finished. Waited until after He had. He had paid the price. And so in the creed, we said, I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our who was conceived by, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And then we pick up with the state of humiliation. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. So that's that position of power and honor. Uh, he, will, he will, from there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. Um, so that's that that judgment piece of it. So that's all with him reclaiming the police with divine power. So now we get to 
it might sound weird that I said that his state of exaltation starts with the descent into hell. Because you asked a really good question. You know, you've heard Jesus descended into hell, um, but he was perfect. Um, see, I think a lot of people misunderstand why he descended into hell. Because you hear that he did it and you just assume, well, of course, why do you go to hell? You go to suffer. But when the Bible talks about it, there's only one passage that very clearly teaches it. And there's a one or two others that kind of um, refer to it, right? And 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 uh, talk about it a little bit. Uh, so we've got the, the one on there that very clearly says it. Um, but before we get there, uh, I've got there the second to hell. It was not to suffer. That was done on the cross. When Jesus was, was on the cross, um, remember this is true God and true man. In Matthew 17, Matthew 27, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So you get the, the Aramaic there, the word, you know, the actual words that he would have spoken. Um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about that. Jesus is still calling him my God. But God had forsaken God. God had turned his back on his son. Because his son was carrying all of our sins, and that's what our sins deserve. He's that's how being separated from God. Um, but Jesus suffered that and then declared it finished. Um, and then it says he was buried and he descended into hell. Let's read first Peter 3 18 and 19. Is that your turn, Bridget? Yes. Okay. But Christ died for for sins once. Once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the Spirit in prison. Yeah, the Spirit's in prison, and then it goes on and describes who those were. It says those who disobeyed long ago, uh, the ones who rebelled and who were who were in hell, right? So, so uh, um Kind of walk through that. He died for sins once for all. We've got that, right? That's Jesus on the cross. Righteous for the unrighteous. He did it to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but then made alive by the Spirit. You could also translate it in the Spirit, uh, through whom or in which he also went and preached to those spirits in prison. Normally, uh, when the English says preach, the normal Greek word behind that is oyangelizomai. Uh, you might hear the word evangelism in there. So oi is good. Um, angelo, an angel, is a messenger. So a good, proclaiming a good message. That's the normal word that gets translated preach. Interesting enough, that's not what's used here. Here we have the word keriso. So a kerix was a herald, right? A guy that worked for the king and his job was to go and... and uh, um, announce whatever message the king sent him to announce. Maybe it was good news, but maybe it was bad news, right? Um, so he's going and, and proclaiming something to these spirits in prison. Uh, in Colossians 2, this is one of those that, that kind of refers to it. I don't have that one printed there, but it, it talks about how uh, he, having disarmed the powers and authorities, so those were names for spiritual forces, uh, so having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And that that term, public spectacle, is the translation of the, the Greek word that was used for the Roman victory parade. So like, uh, you know how before the Romans, any empire that went and conquered something, they would go and, and beat the city-state or whatever, you know, they, they'd defeat them militarily. And then they would tear down all their building, buildings and they'd put salt or rocks in their fields so that stuff wouldn't grow, so that they would have a really hard time rebuilding. Um, that was the way they spread their empire and no one could really come back to mount much of a force because they had destroyed their economy, right? Um, the Romans took a different tack. They would go and just overpower people militarily on the battlefield. They would keep the generals alive and then they would have a victory parade right down Main Street of whatever city it, it was that they just defeated. Um, and the message of that parade 
They'd have all their troops and soldiers march right down Main Street. They'd have the generals tied up in back, um, you know, in this procession. And the message was, you're not stronger than us. You're not going to beat us. You might as well join us. And they didn't destroy their industry. They didn't destroy their economy. They did their best to let them continue doing whatever it was, but just pay it to the Romans, right? So they would help the Roman Empire, and that's how they spread that empire so fast. Um, so then, you know, they'd have that victory parade, march the generals right down Main Street, basically saying, you can't touch us. It's over. Don't try. And then they would go back to Rome. They'd have another parade, and then they'd kill the generals there in Rome. But um, the, the point of it was to demonstrate absolute dominance. Um, so think about that. Jesus died to crush Satan's head, right? To, to defeat sin, to defeat Satan, to defeat death. Um, and then he goes to hell and says, you have no power anymore. Um, you're done. So I just got to ask the question, why? Did I teach you this yet? So whenever we ask, why did God do something? What's the first answer? Because he loves us, right? Um, that, that's always the first answer. Because God is love, that's what he does. It's always so Jesus descending into hell to proclaim victory over the devil um, is an act of love for us. Because you think about it, we're living in a world that it sometimes seems like the devil's winning, mm -hmm. right? Um, sometimes seems like chaos rules and evil reigns. But the one who won our victory was able to go right down Main Street of hell and say, uh-uh, you have no power anymore. Um, he did that for us. So that we can always have that confidence that he will keep his promises and at the end he will come and, and he will make everything right. Um, so he descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. Before I go to that, any questions on the descent into hell? Yeah. Yes. So a couple of things. Does everyone go to hell to be judged before they go to heaven? Okay, great question. So um <clears throat> in when when Jesus was on the cross. The there were two criminals next to him, both mocking him. Um, one of them then realized, wait a second, this guy is different, right? He didn't do anything wrong. Um, and here he is suffering and he's hearing these interactions and he realizes who this is. And so he turns to him and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And and Jesus tells him, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, that guy's body was in a, a pauper's grave somewhere, you know, a mass grave that where they just threw the people they executed into. But Jesus promised him today, you will be with me in paradise. Um, in Ecclesiastes, it talks about when, when someone dies, um, the dust returns to the ground it came from, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. So when we die, our soul and body separate, and the soul of the believer goes to heaven, the soul of the unbeliever goes to hell. In, in Revelation, it talks about the souls of those who have been killed for their faith um, around the throne asking Jesus, how long until you come back and, and finish this off? Um, so the, the souls are one place or the other. And so that's when Jesus descended to hell. It talks about how he proclaimed to the spirits in prison who had disobeyed long ago. You know, so, so those souls of those unbelievers were there. Meanwhile, the souls of believers are in heaven. Is that so why did Jesus go to heaven? To declare to, to tell death. Uh, yep, to tell Satan you're done, you know, th this victory parade, right? Okay. Um yeah, and it might sound boy, is that just uh, arrogance or something? Okay. But, all that but, all that. but he was demonstrating <laughs> that all power all that. for us, right? Okay. So that we can have that comfort and confidence. Okay, and then so you kind of answered my other question. Do people that have no faith still go to heaven? If he forgave all of our sins, that would be a sin to not believe in Jesus and God. Yep. So do those sins get to heaven? Okay. Great question. Let me see if uh, we cover that. Well, can you no, wait two pa can you wait two pages? Okay. okay, awesome. Um so anything else on the descent? Yeah. Yes. Um, you said that uh, the, the sinners are, are in hell and the, the repentant are in heaven. But in the Bible, it says that when you die, it's like you're you're asleep until judgment day. 
Uh, it talks about our, our bodies sleeping. It talks about uh, um, the, the sleep of death uh, as, you know, someone uh, um, talks about those who have fallen asleep. Um, but it doesn't say they, they sleep until judgment day. The bodies are in the ground until judgment day. Yeah, well, then what's what's judgment day all about? If it's already been judged, you're already in heaven. Okay. Yeah, excellent question. I think that's where a lot of people misunderstand Judgment Day. You know, we had uh, this Sunday, Matthew 25 was the was the reading where the disciples asked Jesus, what's going to happen at the end? And he talked about this judgment. And he says that the shepherd is going to separate the people like, that the, the judge is going to separate the people like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. You know, put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. How hard is it for a shepherd to see which one are sheep and which ones are sheep and which ones are goat? Not not hard at all, right? It, it's obvious. Um, on on the last day, if my soul has been in heaven for a thousand years, it's not going to be a surprise which way I'm going. Even if even if the last day is tomorrow, it's not going to be a surprise which way we're going because God made us promises, right? If someone's soul has been in hell for a thousand years. It's not going to be a surprise, right? Judgment Day is not about surprise. Um, this is where you find out where you're going. It's the the public decree, the public demonstration of God's justice, um, and that's why you know the the saints around the throne in heaven are saying, "How long before you do this?" Where where Philippians talks about how every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, even those who pierced him. So uh, everyone will have to say, you know what, God, you're right. Uh, Jesus, the judge, this is just, this is what is right. And they'll have to give glory to God, whether it's because they're going to heaven or because they know that they're, they are getting what they deserved if, if they're going to hell. Um, so the, the judgment is not necessarily a surprise. Um, and I think that's what a lot of, you know, you know just the discussion around it has gotten to, you know, with well, the pearly gates jokes, where am I going to go? Or those questions. You read the Bible and God never wants us to have a, a question about that. He tells us very clearly, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. He says, uh, you who believe have eternal life already. Um, so judgment day is not designed to be some, let's find out what's behind door number two, right? It's, it's, uh, um, it's designed to be a public demonstration, a public display all glory to God that this judgment is, is just and right. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, somewhat. Okay. Yeah. And in lesson eleven, we'll we'll dig into it with a whole bunch of passages if okay. that if that'll help. Okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Anything else on descent into hell? Okay. So he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus. We talk about this being the the high point in the church here. We talk about this being the most important thing about Christianity. Jesus rose from the dead. Paul says, if you don't have that, what's the point? Um, why is the resurrection of Jesus so important? What does it do? What does it prove? Okay. Okay. He's got power over death, right? Yeah. Excellent. What else? It's to fulfill the, what was written. Okay. He does what he says. God's word is good. When, when Jesus said, um, because I live, you also will live. Uh, when he said he's going to rise on the third day, and then he tied that to our resurrection and said, no, if, if I'm living, you're going to be living too. Um, we have that confidence that, yeah, he keeps his word, and he's going to raise me too. What else? Resurrection in general usually is a sign of hope. Okay. Yeah, we have this... This certainty, we have something we can hope for as well, right? I mean, so um, you look at the passages there, Matthew 28, the angel, you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, right? So the announcement of it. Um, and then what does it prove? Well, like you said, all power, right? He's the almighty son of God. Romans 1, uh, Jesus, through the spirit of holiness, was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. His resurrection proved that, that he's the son of God. Uh, 
proves that God accepted the sacrifice for our sins. He was delivered over to death for our sins or because of our sins. He was raised to life because of our justification. When, when Jesus died, he paid for our sins. And, and because our sins were paid for and he had no sin, death couldn't hold him anymore. So he rose proving that our sins were paid for um, and guarantees that we will rise from the dead because he made that, that connection. Um, yeah. Questions on the resurrection? Uh, he, third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven is the next thing in the creed. So between the resurrection and the ascension, so 40 days, Jesus is appearing to his disciples in his glorified body, right? He's showing up in rooms where they are. He, he meets them on, on a, a seaside in Galilee. He meets them on a hill. He's teaching them. He's telling them what's going to happen next. He's preparing them. He says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be your job. You're going to be my witnesses. So he's he's giving them their, their marching orders. Um, he promised to send the, the Spirit uh, in Acts 1 then, and then he ascends into heaven. Uh, the, the disciples are there with him. He's teaching them, and then he says he raises his hands, and he just starts going up. And it says they watch him go up until a cloud hides him from their eyes, and they can't see him anymore. And But they're still staring up in the sky, and all of a sudden there's a couple of angels here standing here saying, okay, guys, um, what you're looking at, uh, you saw him go, you'll see him come. You'll see him come back. In the meantime, you've got a job to do, right? Um, so uh, he ascends into heaven, takes his position at the right hand of the Father, the Bible talks about, that, that right hand of a ruler uh, being the position of power and authority and, and, and judgment. Uh, so he's on the throne with all power. Um, you know, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. So because he's powerful, he sends us uh, to, to do work. Um, and so then the question, what does he do for us now? Why is the ascension such a big deal that he took his place on that throne? You know, if you if you walk into our, our sanctuary, you see a couple of big pictures telling a big story, right? The one facing the road, Jesus died for your sins. Up in front, Jesus ascended into heaven. Why is that? such a comfort well because he tells us what it means um so he is the head of the church let's read ephesians 1 20 to 23 you just read bridget okay, okay so uh vicky do you want to play your pass on uh, ephesians 1 sure okay. the power the power of god which he exerted in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Thank you. Yeah, that, that picture, he's got all power above any rule and authority, power to anything we can know, he's higher than that. Um, and notice the purpose for the church. He's got all that power. He's ruling everything for us. Um, and he gives people to work for the church. Ephesians 4, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. And notice, not to do all the work, but to prepare God's people for works of service of the body of Christ. Um, he, he pleads our case before the Father. The Bible never talks about Mary praying for us. It never talks about the saints praying for us in heaven. It does very clearly say that Jesus, true God, Son of God, the one who has all power and the one who paid our price is the one that's interceding for us. Uh, 1 John 2, 1, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Um, and, and Romans 8, 34, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. And then uh, again, now you want to read John 14, 2? Uh, yes. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. Okay. Okay. Preparing our place. He's preparing us for that place. 
And then you have the, the picture. I think my picture is better than the one on the bottom of the page. But, uh, uh, but yeah, you know, the, the, the value of our Savior is that. Um, the, the next page, you've got some great passages about what it means, right? First John 3, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse, right? Our sins brought curse. Um, he did it by becoming that curse for us. Curse that never hung on a tree. Matthew 27, he suffered that separation from God that we deserve, so that we never have to. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Ella Ann, do you want to read? Uh, sure. What, what was it? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the fourth one on that list. Oh, God made him God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him he might become the righteousness of God. Yeah, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. In first John 3 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish and have eternal life. So now we get into that that question that, that Shelby was asking. For whom did Christ die? How do you answer that? For us. For us? Who's us? Just us in this room? For all believers. For all believers? For the world? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All people. God so loved the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, 2 Corinthians 5. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Our county mentions against him. Um, there are some who would say, well, he only died for those who believe in him. But, but well, the Bible says he died for every sin, right? First uh, John 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, which then leads to that next question, so does everybody go to heaven, if everybody's sins have been paid for? Um, Mark 16, 16, we're back around to you, Deborah. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay, so the payment has been made. And some people use that payment and others reject it. So I always use the picture of, of a, a movie ticket. So let's say you're going to the movie theater, go up to the parking lot, get out of the car, you, you've got 13 cents to your name, you put that in your pocket, you're walking into the movies and I it's been years since I've actually gone to the movies and paid for a ticket, right? So I, I don't know what they cost. Someone surprised me. 10 bucks? 15 bucks? Okay, 15 bucks. All right. So I'm walking in, and there's a guy in the parking lot going, hey, have a great day. I want to give this to you. And he has me a movie ticket. And I figure it's some ad for something, or, you know, there's, you know, fake something or other. I tear it up. I throw it in the garbage. I walk into the uh, um, the person selling the tickets there. I'm like, all right. I want one ticket for this movie, and, and he says, well, that's $15. And I put my 13 cents on the table. Um, what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going in to see that movie. Now, if I had taken the ticket that the guy gave me, he went in and paid for it just because he wanted to give people free tickets. Um, if I had handed that, the guy's like, yep, go right on in. Um, but I tore it up. I threw it up. Jesus paid for all sins, and he is standing here saying, here it is. This gift is for you. Whoever believes in me has eternal life. All you got to do is trust. And again, even that trust, and we'll talk about that in lesson four, how do we, how do we come to faith? How do we get that trust and all of that? But, but just believe. But there are many people who say, no, I would prefer to handle this myself. I can be good enough. Mm -hmm. I can handle this. And if, if I, if, I try to stand before God, and I wouldn't even have the 13 cents before God because my sins are a debt, right? So, um, so I'm negative. But um, if I have that payment, God says, great, paid, hey, come on in. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, but what if you never heard of it? Okay. Another great question. First of all, I'll answer it by saying um, this is God's call. Right, God, it's His heaven, it's His. Uh, that's up to Him. Uh, 
but you're asking me, what do I think will happen? Right? Does it not say in the Bible? Yeah, yeah. So um, the Bible does not call ignorance an, an excuse. Instead, it gives all of us the, the job to share the good news. Now, um, everybody has heard the gospel somewhere in their family line. Right, you know, and the Bible talks about, you know, we had that in the first lesson about the punishing the children for the sins of the father, third and fourth generation. If the parents say, no, we're not going to listen to this, and they teach their kids something else, um, and, and that passes on, that's putting their kids in a really bad spot. Um, it's not an excuse for the kids, uh, but at the time of Adam and Eve, all the world knew about it. At the time of Noah, all the people alive knew about it about God's promises. Um, and then over the course of time, different people, different groups of people have said, no, we don't want to do that. We want to go with this. Um, and missionaries have been throughout the world uh, many times being killed because the people group that they were going to said, no, we don't want any of this um, and, and put them to death. Um, I thank God for the amazing blessing that I was born into a family that believed. Um, and I don't take that for granted. That was an amazing thing that I was born in a place where Christianity was the norm, right? Um, not everybody has that amazing blessing, which motivates me to want to share that, right? Um, but like I started with, it's God's call. But he does say that it is only through faith in Jesus. You know, if if ignorance were an excuse, God's a liar, right? Because Jesus said, is there any other way we can do this? And God could have said, well, let's just not tell anyone about it. And then they'll be okay. Um, but the reality is we are sinners. Um, and, and everybody, I mean, it's, it's on each of us that we deserve hell. And like we talked about in lesson one, God has put plenty in us to make us be looking for an answer. Um, and yeah, I always hate talking about the the sadness of those who don't believe. Um, but in contrast, wow, how blessed are we? Um, let's do our best to share that blessing and send missionaries around the world and 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 support the the spread of the gospel and uh, over the internet and, and the radio and TV and everything else. Um, yeah. Pastor, is there a scripture like is, is there a scripture in the Bible that says everyone would know me? Isn't it sound like it is um in the sun? Like, yeah, there's a there's let me let me come back to you on that one. Okay, okay, um, okay. That help her answer. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's a scripture in the Bible that he says everyone would know me. I don't know if it's verbatim, but, but he was saying like no excuses, you know, yeah. everybody gonna know me. And, I don't and know that, that may be that the one I'm thinking of, uh, like Isaiah's prophecy of of heaven, really, where you won't have to tell your neighbor uh, know the Lord okay. because everyone will know me. Um, is talking about the um, in heaven, okay. right? So. That might not exactly apply to this, but let, let me. Well, you say something about the sun, and I'm just, I'm just. Okay. Something about the sun. It's something with nature. Okay. And okay. everyone will know me, so just come if, to the. Yep, we'll both and I'll research look it up. on oh, it and, okay. and text me if you okay. need to, okay. just to make sure I. We know. I know what you're, uh, what you're asking. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, and we're at 8:05. Can we do one more passage? Christ yeah. famous becomes ours through faith. Acts 16:30. This is when. Um, uh, Paul and Silas were arrested for helping a girl, the slave girl that was that was being abused, and and they drove the demon out. And the owners were upset because the demon was helping her predict the future, and they were making money off it. So they get Paul and Silas uh, thrown in jail, and and beaten, and flogged, and stripped, and put in the stocks. And uh, it's that Paul and Silas are are there praising God. And they're singing hymns and they're telling the other prisoners uh, about Jesus, which I don't know. I, I might have been a little 
in a little worse mood than that, right? But but uh, the jailer is seeing this in the middle of the night. Uh, God sends an earthquake, and then he releases all the chains, and the jailer comes out, and he's about to kill himself because uh, a, a Roman jailer it was a nice gig if you could get it, but it it had some uh, um, problems. If you let anyone go, you took their punishment. Um, and he did not want the humiliation of that. He was about to kill himself. Paul and Silas shout out, don't do that. We're all here. It doesn't make any sense because all the doors were opened and everybody could have run. Um, but Paul had kept them there. Um, the jailer comes up to, to Paul and Silas and, and, and falls on his knees in front of him and, and says this. Do you want to read that one, Sabrina? Yes. Can you tell me Acts? Yep, Acts 16.30. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. He doesn't say, well, you got to make up for what you did to us. He doesn't say, well, if you do this, 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 and this, then you'll be okay. So just believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Um, ruminate on that a little bit, come up with some questions, and we'll start next time with digging into it. I, um, I'd like to give us more time on, on this concept, but. Uh, um, We'll start next time with that. It's all good? Yeah. All right. yeah. Lord, God, Lord God, thank you for giving us your word and for giving us the forgiveness of sins through Jesus. Um, strengthen our faith in you that, that we may always believe and bless us that we may share that good news with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.